Today, we interview the two-time undercover boss, Steve Greenbaum. And he shares how you will know when it's time to franchise your business and what it's like to work with the founder of OxyFresh, Jonathan Barnett. Tis the season to go undercover. I want to make sure we're here to help small businesses thrive. CBS Friday. Please button your shirt. Looks like he might have been from the 70s. Find out who's been naughty. This is one of our major... Tis the season to go undercover. I want to make sure we're here to help small businesses thrive. CBS Friday. Please button your shirt. Looks like he might have been from the 70s. Find out who's been naughty. This is one of our major failures. Yeah. Sorry, man. You have killed my machine. Who's been nice? Can I give you information on PostNet? What about me? I'm a little bit more handsome. You know? <laughs> and who will receive the greatest gift of all? It's here right now. Can we sit? I can get up and hug you. A jolly new undercover boss. CBS Friday. Some shows don't need a celebrity narrator to introduce the show, but this show does. Two men, eight kids, co-created by two different women, 13 multi-million dollar businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Thrive Time Show. <laughs> Yes, and yes, Dr. Z, it is ecstasy when you are next to me, and on today's show, we have a guest by the name of Steve. Steve. Steve Greenbaum, what's going on? Hey, guys, everything's great. How you doing? Man, I'm excited because I've never had a guest on the show with the last name Bomb, and I know you spell it differently, but every time that I say Steve Greenbaum, I'm going to hit the bomb button. Can you say your name when you're in an airport? I mean, because you're, you, <laughs> I mean, is that, it must be tough to travel. Do you have to do a little private jets? I mean, how, how is that? <laughs> it's awesome. It's not a problem. Okay, well, I just, beautiful. You just never it's know. Just, you can't bomb. Say, say bomb. I mean, it's, it's a bad. Now, deal. let me tell you about this guest here, Thrive Nation. I, when I see, I want sometimes the introductions need need a certain subtlety. Yes. A certain clarity. A certain. A certain avoirdoire. Uh, so I'm going to grab my megaphone real quick. Okay. And I'm going to read the announcement here with a well, certain subtle. subtlety. There yeah, you go. Look. Nice, nice move. Nice move. Here we go. Very subtle. Whoa! What did you? What? Z. Change the setting comment there. That's crazy. No, okay, you did. Go. Well. <laughs> Oh no, that's that, annoying. That, that's yeah, don't button. don't do that anymore. Don't, you that's don't just a, do that. no, don't yeah, do me, that. Me, 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 me yes, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on today's show we're interviewing mm -hmm. Steve Greenbaum, who is the founder of Postnet, a former chairman of the International Franchise Association. And Steve has appeared on season four of CBS's Undercover Boss. What? Which can be seen on Netflix in a special episode called Undercover Employee. Steve, how is this possible, my friend? What what life decisions have you made that allowed them to choose you and select you out of all the entrepreneurs? Why do they choose to have you on the Undercover Boss show? That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, they they look to find people that have a story that people want to hear about and that can learn something from. And so hopefully I was selected because they thought I could add value and maybe help um you know, sort of not only ele elevate entrepreneurship, but, you know, kind of show how you can do good and do business at the same time. What was sort of, what was it like to be on the show? I mean, did, you, you obviously did a good job. You're on twice. I mean, what was it, what was it like? Was it, was it, is it heavily scripted? Is it just, they put a camera on like a, a helmet cam and follow you around? I mean, I, what, what's it like to be on the show? Yeah, well, there's only so many details I can share oh, okay. according okay. to some of their agreements. But okay. what I would tell you is it's a lot of work. It's quite a bit of time on the road. Mm. You have very little personal time to yourself. Yes, there is a lot of conversation, communication. They ask a lot of probing questions. They learn a lot about you. They really want to dig deep sort of for your personal why, your personal value proposition. And, um, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, and sometimes it's tough to get face-to-face -face with yourself like that. But it was a good experience for me. Z, my next uh, pre-prepared question, I'm not going to ask it now because I had written down here, Wait, what, what were the names and the social security numbers and the addresses of all the people who worked on the show with you? Well, I'm going to skip that. On the road again, I didn't know. It was <laughs> like, do you have to drive? It was like truck driving. Do you hit a lot of truck stops on the way? I mean, is it, when you're on the road a lot, is it like really you're on the road or you fly around? Or can you, you tell us that? I mean, can you No, you no, we were, we were on the road a lot. We flew. What you mm -hmm. guys might find interesting is imagine you're in this persona of the character and the um, 
disguise that I was in was fairly permanent for the period of time I was in it. And so can you imagine if you've got a good disguise and if anyone has the time to go look, mine was pretty good. Um, getting through TSA in an airport when you show them your driver's license and then they look at you and go, wait a minute, that's, that's you. And uh, sometimes the producers have to come along and help you get through. I knew you had trouble going through an airport. I just knew it. Steve Greenbaum has Steve a problem Green, going through airports. Greenbaum, this just in. This just in. That's my third bomb of the show. I'm, I'm, I'm ready like, to go. I got that button. Exciting, trigger, I I'm trigger happy. You are trigger happy. Okay. Now, uh, here, here would be my, my first uh, real deep, deep question, Z, is because we kind of transition into the deep part of the show. Are we at the deep part now? Um, you've had a lot of success, obviously. And you're continuing to have success. But what was like the very beginning of your career? I mean, what was life? What was life like growing up for you? And, and you know, just tell us what, what where, where it all started. Yeah, sure. So pretty humble beginnings. Uh, grew up on the north side of Chicago, uh, area called Rogers Park. Nice community. My parents divorced when I was very young, around two years old. Mm. And both of them were hardworking people. My mom was a waitress. My dad worked in sales. He was an entrepreneur. He started a number of small businesses. And I think the most difficult part, to be honest, is that they were they were very much at odds with each, each, each other. And, you know, we found ourselves, I had three brothers caught in the middle of their drama. Um, I would tell you by today's standards, it wasn't just difficult. It was oftentimes abusive. But um, I had a great relationship with my brothers um, on a on an interesting note about Steve Greenbaum, that's unusual. I met my best friend. Well, we were too young to know each other, by the way, but my mom came into the hospital to have me as his mom was leaving. They shared a room for about a day, became friends. And, um, we grew up together, went to kindergarten together, went to grammar school together. So my best friend literally has been in my life since I was born. See, who, who else can say that? Not, not yeah. many. I'll, not t- many. I'll tell cool. you who can say that. Steve Greenbaum can say that. Z. <laughs> now, Steve, when did you figure out what you wanted to do professionally? I mean, there's a lot of things. Z, you could, we, he could have become a, a professional bowler or a, 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 an amateur bowler. He could have been uh, a bowling, you know, the guy at the bowling alley who rents you the shoes. It sprays him. He, got he sh- could have been the pretzel sh- vendor at the bowling alley. Uh, <laughs> Devin, you've been to the bowling alley. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of key positions there. He could oh, have been yeah. the bartender at the at the bowling alley that's open one night a week in Broken Arrow. Could be a pin setter. He could have been a pin setter, a, a pin maintainer. Ooh. He could have been a, one of those ball cleaner guys. He could have been the guy who, in, who puts the rose inside the ball, like in the movie Kingpin. Um, why didn't you go bowling as a for for a profession? And then what you know, when did you figure out what you wanted to do professionally? Yeah, well, actually, ironically, I did bowl as a kid, and oh. probably. Spent- <laughs> probably spent too much of my hard-earned money bowling, but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but to come, to come from a uh, kind of a, you know, tough upbringing, um, like I did, I, I kind of found work to be the release for me. And I, I love to work. And so from a very young age, you know, preteen, I shoveled snow in the winter. I raked leaves in the fall. You know, I did lawn mowing and had a service and I loved not only doing the work and it kind of gave me a great kind of headspace to operate in, but, you know, looking back at the work, quality work and taking pride in it, I don't care what it was. And um, so that, I think that's something that really kind of was my, my, you know, created my clarity. Um, I started working full time at 15 years old and I've done a lot of things from digging ditches and working in service departments to moving into sales roles. And, and actually that's where I really shine. And I um, actually worked with my dad in some of his um, businesses that he developed. But um, I kind of knew early that I loved, you know, again, that idea of, you know, hard work and the results that you get from it. And, and um, through working with my dad, the idea of helping people get started in business and succeed in business, that just resonated with me and kind of probably kicked off my post-net career. What did your um, dad do for a living? And where, where, were you, where were you based in the United States? Yeah, so Chicago. Oh, um, the Bears. Yeah, yeah north side. Yeah, north side of Chicago. Oh, and my holy dad, cow! Holy cow! Thank you, Harry <laughs> Carey. Sorry about that. Harry Carey just wanted yeah. to say something. <laughs> Harry Carey was a kind of an icon in my life at that time. Not only that, but the Cubs. But uh, uh, my dad um, started a bar, started a large um, chain of educational 
schools, um, started several different business opportunities. Yeah. Um, he was probably the best salesman I've ever uh, been around in my life. And um, he was, you know, you know, interesting role model as a person, but an exceptional role model as an entrepreneur. Um, could you tell me about your relationship with the Cubs? Were you a big fan of Ryan Sandberg, uh, Sean Dunstan? Uh, were, you, were, you, were you deep, dark into the Cubs lore? Did you care? Was it casual? <laughs> what was the relationship like with the, with the Chicago Cubs? Yeah, so my, my relationship was huge, but you're revealing my age because mm. my relationship was with Ernie Banks, Ron Stano, oh, wow. Don Kessinger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, you know, the Cubs, I was a Cubs fan in the 70s. Um, you can go as uh, deep into this or as shallow as you want. Uh, you can punt if you want. I just want to ask you, you, you mentioned that your dad was a great role model in, in business and maybe yeah. interesting was the word. Um, personally, could you, because I think there's some listeners out there, see, we all come from families, uh, many of which have come from divorces, uh, families where they haven't had a you know great role model as a mom or a dad, and somewhere we have great role models, or sometimes it's confusing because someone can be great in one area and bad in another area. When you said interesting, what does that mean? Yeah, so what it, what it means is that having divorced parents, oftentimes we didn't see my dad for long periods of time, or it was weekend visits. And so he was in and out of my life really until about my teens or maybe a little bit later on. So, you know, where a lot of kids maybe had a father to turn to for advice, a father, you know, I really kind of grew up with a weekend father and sometimes not even a weekend father. So that, that was what I, but what I can tell you is um, what I learned from him about the, you know, the way to treat people, mm. uh, how to run businesses. And, and listen, I will tell you, he was a big, bold figure. I don't agree with everything he said and did, but he had the courage of a lion. And um, I saw him make decisions and move on and go after what he wanted in a way that I think really inspired. Now, you, you started PostNet in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada in 1992. And, uh, uh, see, I'm, see, we're always curious about the, the, the founding of companies. You know, see, like, PostNet became a huge company. Um, but th th there's something magical, Z, about starting a company. Z, do you remember oh, yeah. when you started your optometry clinic? Oh, yeah, it's just fantastic. Was it, were you, was Z, were you nervous? Were you excited? Were you both? Talk to me about that hair on fire moment when you decided to start your optometry clinic. How many years ago, by the way? It was the move. 20, what, 91 is when I started it. So that's what, 28 years ago? 28 years ago. What, were, did you, was it, were you, were you nervous, Z, when you started your business? Oh, I think there's always a little bit of nervousness, but you turn that into, you know, performance. Kind of like going on stage, you know? Do you, you have a, if you don't have a little butterfly in your stomach, then you're probably not taking it serious enough. And so, for me, it was it was a combination of that, but you know, also that 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 vision that you're going to be successful and do whatever you need to do and work as hard as you need to work to make it happen. So, you know, I mean, yeah, that was the good old days. Well, that's 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 a hat. That's a hot second ago. When you bought a bank, were you nervous? Well, I wasn't until we closed on it. And then, like the next month, we have the Great Recession. It's like that's good timing. <laughs> right. All right. So we're going to Las Vegas here. The year is 1992. Go. There we we're go. going back to there 1992 we go. with Steve like Greenbaum. Yes, folks. Here we go. So, Steve, I want to ask you, how did you go about starting PostNet? What is PostNet? What was PostNet? Talk to us about how you started PostNet. Sure thing. So my father and a business partner and um, uh, got involved in a – retail mailbox rental business back at that time mailboxes weren't available for rent and um, so that was kind of how I got interest, introduced to the retail mailbox business and then um, we decided to develop a, kind of an independent mail center concept some of you may remember um, mailboxes etc oh, yeah. but you know retail shipping mailbox rentals you know packaging gift wrapping really basic business and um, in any event, we uh, launched this independent non-franchise business and literally from 1985 to 1991 developed over 400 independent mail and parcel centers. Wow. And what was unique? Go ahead. I'm sorry. So you said 400? Yes, 400. Between what years? 1985 and 1991. I, I just want to marinate on that for a second. See, I, 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 we yeah. need to marinate just for a second. Sorry, I just need to... Yeah, this, oh. He just said between 1985 and what year? What, what year? 1991. 1991. He grew 
four hundred something. Mm. Four. I, mm. That. That's like that's that like deserves, you having children. I mean, you. That's about that about correlates with you. That that deserves for me to hit the Steve Green bomb button one more time. I just he just dropped a Steve Green bomb on me. Okay, Steve Steve Green knowledge bomb. Uh, Steve, um, four hundred. <laughs> yes. How? How, how did you fund this thing? I mean, where'd you, were you, were you, were you, did you have like a snow cone stand on the, on the side? Were you part of the uh, cartel? Were you I mean, part of a happened? cartel? Did, were you selling b- bell bonds to, to shady criminals? Or how, how did you get the funding to do this? Yeah, you know, so quite frankly, um, got a little bit of help with um, family on getting the retail mail talk, mailbox business going. Opened up several of these um, small retail shipping businesses in Las Vegas. Yeah. And it was a very interesting commodity at the time because UPS and FedEx did not have delivery to retail, you know, to to the community other than if you wanted to ship a package, you had to go to a commercial area and and work in a commercial counter with limited hours. And so the idea of and then if you wanted to rent a mailbox in Las Vegas when it was booming in growth in the late 70s through really the 90s, um, you, you had to wait waiting list three to six months so really? huge demand we we rented out you know thousand mailboxes in a business as quick as we opened them and so great demand and what's interesting is we use the capital from the success of the um retail stores to fund um the uh independent development and consulting firm and the success of the independent development and consulting firm formed PostNet, the franchise company and we um, never had any debt, no venture capital, no angel investors. This was purely self-funded on the strength of the business model and hard work. 400 locations. Um, what was the hardest part of building those 400 locations? Yeah, you know, I don't remember a really hard part. I know that doesn't sound very truthful, but, um, you know, we were helping people identify a name for their business and find locations and get trained and open. I, I guess maybe the hardest part was that people wanted more support. They wanted a collective name or a trademark. They wanted um, uh, business negotiating, uh, national discount support. And that's what prompted uh, the decision to franchise, quite frankly, because those independent businesses we've put together have nothing to do with the um, uh, post nets that we opened subsequently. We didn't convert those. Post nets started as a new brand, and we built forward. Talk to me about franchising. What, what kind of people out there should look to franchise their business, and what kind of people should not? Yeah. So I'm not sure you asked, it, you asked a question in a unique way. Uh, kind of people that should franchise their business would be people that know and understand the power and the value of a system and trademarks because the the identity and the of the business and the you know the brand that you build and the promise that that brand creates is critical to the success of the company and then more importantly the operating system how it delivers its products and services and provides value to the customer is number one I, the, the second part of what i thought you might have been asking is how do you know if you want to be a franchisee or buy a franchise? And that's a, that's a different discussion, which I'm happy to expand on if you want to go there. Let's talk about the, the uh, let's say I have a business right now and I have a plumbing business. I'm doing about $3 million a year doing plumbing. And uh, see, people like me. And my company's called something like, you know, Gary's Plumbing. Yep. But your name is Clay. Uh, well, well, let's, hi, I, hypothetically, in, 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 in an <laughs> alternative universe, uh, 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 let's say that. Okay, Gary's Plumbing. Here we go. So it's, Bring it on. Here he is. It's Gary's Plumbing. And I am Gary. And when the phone rings, I answer the phone. And we do have about half of our business is commercial, half is residential. That's fair. There's no scripts, no systems, there's no checklists. There's just Gary and a group of like seven or eight dudes. We're very profitable, though. But it's scary to think about what happened, what would happen if, if Gary disappears. It's scary to think what would happen if Gary pieces out. I mean, could the business carry on without Gary? Why is it so scary? Because it, it, it's all in Gary's head. Talk to me about how the business owner knows if it's time to franchise, to, to become a franchise, to build a franchise system that they could sell to, uh, award to other potential franchisees. Yeah. So I would say to you that 
if the pure motivation is to build and sell, I don't think that's the best motivation to create a franchise company. If the motivation is to help people succeed in business and in life through franchising and provide a better customer experience, then that's the right reason to do it. And how you would know is not only if you had a very successful business model yourself, but if you were able to create a set of standards and implement um, a method of doing business, an operation or an operations manual, and you were able to transfer that knowledge or know-how, and again, associate that with a business name or trademark that spoke to your value proposition that you could build that stands for something more than just plumbing, but would stand for why people should choose you or do business with you over anyone else. So what I would tell you is franchising as a business scheme isn't the best idea. Franchising is a way to help enrich and lift other people up around you and enhance the customer experience. Good idea. Jonathan Barnett, the founder of OxyFresh, he and I are are partners on a couple different uh, ventures. He uh, speaks very highly of you, and I'm not sure if if that's because – um, you're, you're paying him like you know maybe you're buying lunch for him every day or something or, or what would the but he but for I mean a long time I mean I've known John for 12 years and for many of those years he's spoken highly of you and he uh, views you as a mentor why have you decided to invest uh, time and Jonathan Barnett specifically and um, what kinds of things have you ha- you know I mean I'm not asking you to give intimate details of your relationship but he speaks so highly of the mentorship you've provided him if you can recall what kind of things have you have you and Jonathan talked about as it relates to scaling and uh, opening more and more OxyFresh franchises? Yeah, well, uh, you know, thank you for the comment, and I'm I'm um, I feel you know equally strong about him as an entrepreneur as a friend. He, he's really an impressive person with respect to the way he looks at business. But um, a lot of my time with Jonathan, Jonathan, both in the past and even most recently, has a lot to do with looking at the future of the business, at systems, processes, structure, and strategy, because he's a fast-growing brand. And his technology platforms and his value proposition are, are extremely high. But how to take his company from where he is in size and revenue to the next level and then uh, Jonathan, of course, and I know because you're involved, is looking at integrating other potential French brands to expand the platform. So, you know, again, having the right structure and organization and strategy to be able to um, ensure that every franchisee and every brand feels like they're the most important brand and franchisee in the system is critical to the success of the company. And that's something that I I love to do. That's just kind of how I'm wired. So my work with Jonathan, you've got this incredibly smart entrepreneur that has some of the best tech and marketing technology I've seen in franchising, um, but tackling a lot of big issues about how to make sure we grow intelligently and properly and ensure that we keep our value proposition strong. So that's the side of the kind of the house I sit on with Jonathan, and it's a lot of fun. I don't know whether uh, this is accurate because, Z, this just in. Uh, some of the things that we read on the Internet are not true. What? I know. Whoa, I know. Stop, stop, I, stop. I know, stop. Uh, That's just no, wrong. I, it's I, mean. I, I know. Mr. Internet got kind of upset with us there. But um, I read that you guys merged with or sold uh, PostNet to MBE International in 2017. What were, uh, what, what were the big benefits of, of teaming up with these guys, and why did you decide to move on to a new thing? Yeah, yeah. So it was actually a sale. Really didn't team up with them. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And kind of what led to the sale is, you know, many, many years in our business, and I, I had um, a business partner that I had been working with for many, many years. Uh, to be honest, I never really considered selling. I saw myself in that business for the rest of my life. And, you know, it's, it's interesting when you work very closely with someone, and I came to the realization through that process that, Uh, this gentleman that I had been working with might start seeing his life differently and the way he wanted to do things. And I think that, that influenced me as well, but, you know, more importantly, mailboxes, et cetera, was a brand with a lot of international experience, um, been around a long time outside of the United States. And I felt like there was a good possibility they could, they could bring more value and benefit and opportunity to my franchisees. I thought that by them being a come a part of even a bigger global hole than we had built, 
that they see better opportunities and strategic advantages. And I'll tell you, many of the folks that I had put into business, some of them are, are some of my dear friends today. So it was way more about, well, as much about purpose for me as it was about profit, quite frankly. And, and then, you know, as the idea of maybe doing something, selling the business uh, started to um, kind of percolate a little bit, I started to become a little bit curious about what might be next for me. And this is going to go deep and maybe personal as well. But when you're a self-made founder and you go yep. into business and you bring in a team and you kind of put your flag in the ground and, you know, you're the CEO and you grow it. For me personally, as someone that's a student of the franchise business, I always kind of wondered what, what kind of metal would I have in a different business, in a different industry? What, what kind of CEO am I really versus just a guy that grew up, found a business he loved, and put his heart and soul into it? So I think that curiosity had a big part in um, w why I made the decision to sell. And so now, uh, rumor has it, you're not uh, just uh, sipping my ties on the beach there, uh, but you started this new <laughs> thing called uh, Full Contact Franchising. Um, do you teach football players how to become better linebackers, or what do you guys do at Full Contact uh, Franchising? Yeah, no, um, actually, Full Contact Franchising is a concept that I have kind of evolved with uh, over the years because you know, my analogy is franchising is a full contact sport. Now we know it's not sport when people invest their life savings in a business and they partner with a franchisor and, you know, both sides are working for a great customer experience. So it's kind of a bit of a stretch on the analogy, but the idea is that it's interdependent and both sides really need each other to be successful in business. And my idea of full contact is all in, in the business, uh, open and honest with franchisees, facing issues, challenges, and opportunities head on in an open, honest, and constructive way with your team and your franchisees and building a very healthy, cohesive um, organization. And so full contact just resonates for me because most franchisors not only struggle with growth, they struggle with managing growth, technology, um, HR, you know, you know, as it relates to employee retention, competition. And um, I really felt after developing a brand over a multitude of decades and weathering a lot of storms, economic and otherwise, yep. that that was a space that was that was the calling I kind of talked to you about in the beginning. So you um, work with franchisors, am I correct? That is correct. Okay, Z, Z, this just in. I get okay. one mega point. Here we go. Wow, That's I, well, impressive. I'm, I'm, tr I'm tracking I'm with it. When you have a guy like this on your show, Steve Greenbaum, sometimes you know you're, you find yourself thinking about when should I hit the bomb button. When should I pay attention? Can I do both at the same time? Probably. Not. So I've been trying to do both, and so I've like mentally, I've been mentally amb ambidextrous. You did, I mean, how many times are we gonna have a, a bomb on the show? A, a, a green bomb. <sighs> Let me think about this. Let me think. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Is Marty uh, Greenbaum? Hold on, your, hold is on, Marty hold Greenbaum your brother? It, he is. We gotta yes, get Marty is. on the show. There may be two bombs. I mean, we could. You know what? We just need to do a Google search of, of green bombs and just get any random <laughs> green bomb we can on the show. Zay, I'm going to let you, I'm going I'm to turn the mic over. I'm going to let you now interrogate our guest because we've started from the bottom. Now we're here. Now it's time for the, for the part of the show. A lot of times, Z gets sort of rude and hostile. He gets out the, the, the a lot of times we have in-person guests. He'll get out the, the light bulb, just yeah. the one light bulb, yeah. take him to a room. He'll do the whole good cop, bad cop thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Z, ask anything you want. All, any, anything goes at this point. Oh, okay, Steve, I, I, we, I'm going back in the interview just a little bit because mm. Clay skips over the juicy parts. Yeah. He skip, just, skip you know, juice. he does it. I'm a he juice just, skipper. He's a juice skipper. I'm That's just, what I do. I've been, I'll call it what it is. So the character that you did on the show, the 70s motorcycle guy, that is a great, yep. great outfit, by the way. <laughs> was that really, you. did you just give them an old picture of yourself and say, just do me up from the 1970s? Is that what that is, really? Or the Yeah, no, a a actually, great question, Z. What, what happened was they did, they did actually ask me what you wanted to do. And at the time when I thought about it and talked to some of my kids, they said, how about Game of Thrones? That would be very cool. Oh, yeah. Cool. And, character. So they had you to drag <laughs> so it outfit? <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of the motivation for the look. But what happened was when we did the first kind of run at the disguise, uh, one of the producers kind of looked and said, well, you know what? 
I, I think we could kind of mix this up a little bit. And something else you guys don't know about me is I'm uh, a private pilot. I have several motorcycles. I've been riding motorcycles since I was a kid. Uh-huh. Um, scuba, scuba dive. I do a lot of kind of there we go. Put, put yourself out there stuff. And yeah. I think CD, I think they found that interesting. So that motorcycle persona kind of evolved out of that Game of Thrones look and some of my personal hobbies. Is that a real tattoo in your right arm or is that a, a fakey? No, that's that's a real tattoo. Yeah, and what, and what is it? Because you can't see it in this picture that I have. Is that a? Yeah, is that, a, says it's mom or what is it? I'm, uh, I'm a Leo, and uh, it's kind of my persona, quite frankly. Nice. And, and what was the yeah. name? What was the name? I didn't watch the show, but what was the name that you went under? What was your, what was your um, stage name? You know, believe it or not, I can't remember the last name, but his name was Brad, and there's a story about that because one of the best PR firms in franchising is called Fishman Public Relations. And Brad Fishman, who's been a friend for 25 years, not only said, hey, this is something you ought to consider, but also recommended me to Undercover Boss. And, of course, they loved it, and that's how I got there. So I named the character after Brad. Yeah, perfect. So you actually knew a Brad. That's, that was another question I had for you. That's kind of fun. So let's get, yeah. back, let's get back over to Full Contact. So what is your, what is your goal with Full Contact? What do you, what do you see it, it doing and changing the world and helping the world be a better world? Mm. Yeah, thank you. So I, I see Full Contact being an organization that, you know, creates balance and healthy, sustainable, profitable growth in franchise organizations. I know that's a mouthful, but the idea of balance and the, the logo that we're developing is kind of a yin-yang. And the idea behind that balance is that, you know, again, you've got this franchise or franchisee relationship, and um, it can be tough at times for both sides. And the franchisor has some other, some responsibilities like protecting the system and the trademark that kind of create a little bit of imbalance every now and then. Sure. So, so my, my goal behind Full Contact is to help companies navigate that balance and, again, build very profitable, sustainable, successful companies. Fra- franchising is a wonderful business when everyone's succeeding. If one side or the other is leading in the success, it doesn't work. So my idea behind Full Contact is really lift companies, lift organizations up, help them really operate better and more effectively and more profitably. And to be honest, I was so buried and immersed in PostNet for the better part of my business career that I really um, oftentimes put the business before myself and sometimes before my family. So one of my goals in full contact is to help, you know, young and emerging brands and even established brands recognize that to be great at the business, you got to be great at taking care of yourself and your family too. Absolutely. So if I'm a business owner listening to right now and I've got a slick little business that I think, Hmm, I think I want to franchise this. At what point in the process should I contact you? Should I wait till I've got 10 stores and I've got a huge problem and I'm, I'm, one of my franchisees wants to throat punch me and I need a call. I need, I need, a, I need a, a guy that a jet can fly in and fly me out of there quickly. I mean, at what, what point in the process should I contact Good you? Question. Yeah, it's a great question. I, w- I would say that, listen, I, I probably w- would be happy to be a resource to people that are thinking about franchising, but it's, it's really not um, – the space I'm in right now, there are a lot of companies and law firms that help people decide sure. that franchising is right for them. So that, that's not really the space I am, I, I've kind of gone after. Not that it's something I wouldn't consider for the right brand or the right opportunity, but I would say that if you're 10 or 200 locations and you either want to focus on growth, strategic and competitive advantages, um, you know, really adding and building value, not only for the organization, but the people that um, are a part of it. Um, that, that's really my sweet spot. Because to your point, what happens is people get into franchising a lot of times with the right notion or the right ideas. And they find themselves in a business where, you know, that you've got 10 or 50 people that have invested either their life savings or leg- sure. uh, leverage you know, leverage some capital from their retirement accounts or whatever oh, yeah. it may be that are relying on them to help them succeed. So, you know, the notion of franchising is really sexy. Oh, I'm going to create 100 or 500 or 1,000 of these. The responsibility of doing that properly and effectively um, and doing it in a, you know, in kind of a fun and holistic way where you, you're building success with people 
it, it, because when it goes bad, it goes bad. <laughs> it's very bad. Wait a second. So, you mean there's, yeah. it's just not all kumbaya between a franchise zor and a franchisee? I mean, it's not just all, it's just not just like a love, kumbaya, like a like just a. I mean, they're not just sitting kumbaya, around and and uh, kumbaya, you know. Hey, give me a little songbird. I my you got my board shut kumbaya, down here. I have I mean, your soundboard <laughs> muted. I mean, it's not just hey. It's your franchise or just check in with you, buddy. How's it going today? It's doing great. It's awesome. Record sales again? Hey, of course. I appreciate you for reprimanding wow. me for misusing the logo. I knew that was going to be a Thank home run. Thank you so much for telling me. Wow. I appreciate you for holding me accountable. You're one of my favorites, by the I way. I appreciate you. are the best. But I've got a lot of favorites, so don't get too caught up on that. All the money I have, I just burn it to heat my house because I feel guilty. <laughs> of course you can buy my lunch again today. Mm. Mm. There's not just That's not everything that goes on. It seems like that's the way it'd be. Um, first of all, wow. <laughs> and what I, what I would tell you is that when franchisees are feel valued and included and respected and they're making money, it goes a lot like that. And I think there's a lot of mutual respect and mutual appreciation when the business model is challenged or it's tough to make money or uh, a, a, a competitor comes in and challenges the validity of the model or maybe even starts to eat up market share, the relationship can change dramatically. So I, you know, what I would say to you is it's a huge responsibility to franchise. This is, this is not like investing. This is making a decision to be responsible for following through on brand promises, promises to people and um, always, striving to improve. I guess what I would tell you is franchising is a journey. It's not a destination. Ooh, nice and every time, word. every time you think you've gotten there, the destination moves or you're not being relevant and competitive. Okay. Uh, before I kick you back oh, over yeah. to Clay, cause oh, yeah. he's got some hard hitting stuff. He wants to hit you. Hard with. hitting. You, you did keep that look, right? I mean, you did keep the long hair and the dark beard. I mean, you did, you did keep that, right? I mean, you did go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but my wife wanted me to. <laughs> well, there you go. Hey, hey, honey, it's it's biker biker Steve this weekend. If you know what I mean. Whoa, so, hey, Shunda, Shunda. <laughs> wow, we're gonna have okay. to transition right there. I, okay. At that, uh, it's a. Uh, some romantic that we just happened. To. That's like a <laughs> marriage tip for somebody out there. Now I want to I want to mention this because we talk about the relationship between franchisors and franchisees. And we have time for three quick questions, but I want to share something that happened with OxyFresh that was not so awesome, but it's awesome now. When John Barnett and I met each other in college at, o at Oral Roberts University, um, mailing things was a thing. You know, ma mass mailers, and so when OxyFresh really took off, you know. JB was using the latest, greatest technology at the time. Do you remember, like, yellow pages and mass mailers? Oh, I'm old enough I remember all that. And that was the deal, like those Valpac blue mailers and oh, yellow sexy, pages. It was hot. Sexy, sexy. And all of a sudden, this thing called Google uh -oh. started being used. And, uh, Steve, were you at the event where JB asked me to come and speak about the National Ad Fund? Were you at that event, that, that annual conference? I, I wasn't. But, oh boy! Um, See, he asked me. This is what he said. This is what he said to me. He said, "Clavis, Clavis, my my good friends call me Clavis." He says, "Clavis, um, you need to come in and help me uh, uh, deliver a message." I said, "What's the message?" He says, "Well, we're going to have to raise. We're going to have to charge a national ad fund for the first time, which is an extra. I think it was two percent or something. We have to charge all franchisees to cover search engine optimization, online marketing, and digital enhancements. A single sign-on." And I'm going. So you want me to speak as the motivational guy to come up and speak after you tell people that you're raising their fees by 2% or before? Because uh -oh. if I go before, <laughs> then that's an easier sell sure. than after. I went after. Uh oh. So he got up there and talked to people about why he was going to raise the fees. And I, uh, most people were going, are you kidding me? Boo. Serious? No, you could, it, it could almost sense that the, the corporate feeling was... Oh, yeah. And I'm just like, hold strong, buddy. Hold, hold strong. strong. And he had, he had all these facts going for him. And these people were, were, a lot of these people were, they built their business based off of mailers. But he was adapting, and he's a little bit ahead of the curve of the average person. But if he waited to, for, until everybody had consensus, it wouldn't have happened. Now, OxyFresh dominates Google search results. A lot of their business comes in from online marketing, and it really changed the game. But it can get difficult. And thankfully, thankfully in his system at OxyFresh, I would say the vast majority of, of the franchisees wanted the change, were encouraged by the change, needed the change, but there were still people in there who said, 
the internet's never going to catch up. We can't make this change. Yeah, I mean, Al Gore, thank you, but no thanks. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So, I mean, I have mad respect for guys like you and JB who've done very well in the franchising space. We have time for three quick questions, two of which are coming from me and one from Dr. Z. Steve Greenbaum, okay. what, quest- what, is, what is a book that for the listeners out there who have a lot of questions about the franchising world um, or just scaling a business, what is a book that you would recommend for all of the listeners? Yeah. Yeah, so I would I would I would tell you that, you know, talking about digital marketing, I think Crushing It by Gary Vaynerchuk is probably one of the one of the best books on succeeding in online marketing and Got speak it. a lot to what you talked about with J B. Yep. So I, I think Crushing It's a great book. And then the other is Start with Why with Simon Sinek, who hmm. I think um, does a great job of helping people to understand the difference between manipulation and inspiration in businesses and talks about how inspiration is really the right tool for growing a business. I think those are two great books, no matter what business you're in. Okay, and then my, my final question that I have, and I'll let Z uh, wrap up the show with, with this final hard-hitting, always offensive, always across-the-line question here. Um, your idiosyncrasies. Um, entrepreneurs have idiosyncrasies. Steve Jobs wore the same thing every day. Barack Obama started to wear the same thing every day during his presidency. Elon Musk is famous for working 100-hour work weeks. Um, everybody's got their own thing. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg wears the same thing every day. Uh, Sarah Blakely <laughs> likes to wear her own products. Talk to me about this. What is an idiosyncrasy that you have that you believe has allowed you to achieve uh, success? Maybe maybe, like a, maybe a superpower that some might consider to be a, a uh, eccentric idiosyncrasy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I don't think I have anything that interesting. I would tell you probably my three superpowers would be attention to detail. Got it. Um, urgent urgency which is something, you know, I'm incredibly urgent, and passion. I think passion is a superpower. Super, and I hear that from JB all the time, that you are a man of passion. And if you're out there and you have a franchise, I'm just telling you, and you need someone to kind of coach you to the next level, um, I've known JB. How long have you known JB, by the way? How, how long have you and John Barnett known each other? Oh, my gosh, since he started franchising. So that's got to be 13, 14 years, right? Yeah, I, say, I feel like I've been hearing yeah. about you. For a long, long time, and you're busy, and I'm busy. I'm busy too. So we met like I think one time we did a handshake up there in, in Denver, or maybe a couple times. But I hear great things about you all the time, and so it's a real honor to, to have you on the show, uh, Doctor Z. We have time for you to, to take the show to the next level, to the or, next or, level, or, or, to, or, or, or to the bottom. I mean, yeah, you could go up to the top. Let's do both. Let's do or both. to the bottom. Let's do both. Like a tornado, like a roller emotion. coaster. We're like a roller coaster. Roller coaster of love. love. Say what? So, okay, two hard-hitting questions. One, Your love is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. See where they are? That's the I DJ Clay. There we go. There's DJ Sorry. Clay. Sorry. Clavis. Clavis. For, for us to know him, Clavis. Mm. Were you, first, were you happy with the ending of Game of Thrones, to be honest? <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was. I thought it was interesting. I know a lot of people had different opinions about it, but the answer is yes. You were happy. You were, like, pleased. Yep. You're on a scale of 1 to I 10. Mean, You're, like, a 9, 9.3. I mean... I was. Uh, let me just say I was fine with it. Okay, well, <laughs> fine. Happy <laughs> or two different things. Here we go. Got the, okay, the last question. Roller coaster. Roller coaster. You're going back in time. We're going back in time with this song. So this question is about going back in time. You could go back in time, say 20, 25 years. The uh, you're starting PostNet. You're starting all your business. You're starting all that business. You're starting the roller coaster. You're just getting in the cart. You know about uh, the the beginning of the ride, shall we say? And you get a chance to sit next to yourself. And give yourself advice while you're on the ride. The roller coaster's going up and down and round and round, spinning and all that. What would you go back and tell yourself, say, 20, 25 years ago? What would you say to yourself? You say, self, self, fill in the blank. Yeah, I would say, self, make sure you make more time for yourself, more time for your family. And it, it, no matter how much you love this business, if it consumes you to the extent that others sacrifice something, then you got to make a change. Mm, mm. See, that was good. That was good. That we was, hear, and we hear that more often than not. See, we do. Yeah. We hear this all the time. And I would, I would say if you're out there today, a little, a little self-check here. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, 1 being the worst, rate your satisfaction right now with your life and the areas of your faith, your family, your finances, your fitness, your friendship, and your fun. Your faith, family, finances, 
fitness, friendship, and fun. Because you might be super buff, Z. We've all met guys who are super buff. Super buff. Bomb bomb so pumped up. Bomb 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 and, and you're like, uh, can lift the hey, world. so how, how's your son? I don't know who my son is. I forgot his name. I, do I have one? I'm not and even we, sure. And we've, we've all met people who are financially just super successful. I have so much money I can buy you right now. And we say, uh, hey, hey how, how, how's your daughter doing? And they go, uh, I have a daughter. What? What is her name? So we've all met people different sides of the spectrum. We've all met people that have so much faith. And so little jobs. And they're sitting there on the side of the road well, I'm expecting giving you the life Lord tips. To give me, I'm expecting the Lord to get me a job any day now. They're at the coffee houses right now writing poems. Yes. While living off of your donations. We've all seen we're, we're all imbalanced in some area. So rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. How, rate your, your satisfaction with the areas of your faith, family, finance, fitness, friendship, and fun. And if you have a 10, that's great. Good job. You're the winner. If you're a 1, we have some room to improve. But don't give yourself a 7. Let's give ourselves some honest assessment about where we can improve. And uh, I can tell you this, one way we can improve this show is we need to have Steve Greenbaum on like every day. Every day. I mean, every day. Just, every day. <laughs> it's the Steve Greenbaum show starring Steve, Steve Greenbaum, Greenbaum and Greenbaum us. And, and every now and then us. Steve, thank you so yeah. much for being on the show, man. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. It's been, a, it's been a lot of fun. You guys are great. And now, without any further ado, three, two, one, boom! Are you serious about growing your business? Do you want to save yourself a bunch of time, money, and headaches? Well, what this situation requires is for you to take some massive action. It's time for you to sign up for the world's most affordable and effective education for entrepreneurs today at ThriveTimeSchool.com. Again, that's ThriveTimeSchool.com. Sign up today at ThriveTimeSchool.com. I dare you.